Hi friends, Max Elhaj here on this episode of the Corpus Animus Podcast. I have training think tank coaches Adam Rogers and Kyle Ruth on. And because we have one week left in the open, we talk about how to reframe your experience if your results are not matching your expectations, elite level athletes struggling with the temptation to repeat workouts, and how different level of athletes should prepare for stage two. And we talk about me getting sick during 19.5 and a little bonus Kyle Ruth's nickname when he was a drunk college guy. Before we get into it, make sure you hit that subscribe button because we're on our road to 35 5k subscribers and when we hit that milestone we're going to give away a black zinc rogue 2.0 barbell leave a comment below with what your drunk college nickname would be that comment is what's going to enter you into the giveaway once we reach that 35,000 subscriber milestone we'll use a random youtube comment generator on one of these videos where we promoted the giveaway to draw a worldwide winner for that bar so all you got to do is be subscribed and comment below to enter train along some of the best athletes in the world at the sport of crossfit to get a free sample week of our current training cycle, head over to trainingthinktank.com slash DSGN. Paper puppet held up with like little wiggly like Cheeto sticks inside of me. And like those <laughs> Cheeto sticks are the caffeine in my system. This and is it's, the most specific. That's awesome, yeah. I f like I feel my body like ready to disintegrate in a strong gust of wind. And it's like this, the caffeine is holding me together. Why Cheetos? <laughs> Have you ever seen the meme where it's like the, there's a Cheeto in the door lock in the hinge of the door lock and like this is what's keeping us safe? It's like just a fucking little crunchy Cheeto. No, like, no. It's going to break so easily. It's like that's what my that's body here. feels like. Like that my body is going to break so easily right now. For real. All right. So we're going to be talking about this year's open, but we're not going to be talking about it from like uh, analyzing the workouts perspective. We're going to be talking about it more from like how it's impacting athletes and and how it's impacting us maybe as coaches and and look at it from that perspective. So we've got a couple talking points. Adam's got some awesome stuff that he brought in. So we're going to talk about, <laughs> and no, he's I, got a red bull holding a red his bowl, body means, together like a uh, Cheeto. If this thing runs out, everybody's in trouble. <laughs> Adam's just going <laughs> to melt into the floor while we're talking. No, the, I mean, this year's been, I mean, different is the best way to say yeah. it, but it's just, I think the contrast from years prior and then going into this year has just been throwing a lot of people for a loop. And I feel like it's worthwhile to have this conversation now before we get into week three, just to make sure that we're doing our best as coaches and as an organization to hold people accountable, right? To still finish what you started, still make sure that you have focus off of whatever your individual goals are. So, I mean, it could be like a uh, elite athlete there years prior then maybe they've been in the, in the sport for, you know, six, eight, 10 years now, they're used to the open being super freaking important for their season to putting a lot of value into their scores, to making sure that they're peaked for each workout. Like they could have been really likely to proceed to regionals or sanctionals, or whatever it is, but they're used to putting a lot of weight into what the open score is this year for that crowd. It, it really doesn't matter that much, yeah. right? Like you can be one and done. You could have some no reps. You could, you know, finish 8% in the world or whatever it is. It doesn't matter for you. That's not your competition. People are really, really hesitant to accept that though. And we're seeing that a lot. We saw it in week one. We saw, we see it in week two. You see a lot of people doing redos when there's no reason, no objective reason yeah. to do redos, but there's plenty of emotional reasons to do redos. That's been Pride. one of the biggest things that I've seen is that people will turn in scores and when they get done with it, they're like, yeah, I'm happy with that. Mm -hmm. And then you advance two days where the leaderboard starts to evolve. And you know, we have our internal yeah. leaderboard that starts to evolve and they see some of the names that have beat them. And they're like, no, I can't, I, I need to do it again. <laughs> I, I, I yeah. need to do it again for myself. Yeah. The, for the, <laughs> the quote that I've sent to a lot of people, I think it's a Teddy Roosevelt quote, I think is comparison is the thief of joy. And it's like this idea that you train a long time. And like, you know, if you're in the design or if you're a member of TTT, you might see other people's scores, but seeing it on a worldwide stage where like you thought you were going to be maybe like top hundred, top 200 in the world. And you look and you're like 500, 600, 700, it steals your joy in that yeah. moment to see that comparison and be like, Oh shit. Like that's not good. You start questioning a lot of things. You question your training, you question your prep, you question your capacity right now in this moment. Am I really ready? Am I as good as I thought that I was? Yeah. And it makes people worried for stage two. I right. think the other like wrench in the system is that we've seen two point ones. I know we've had 21.1 mm -hmm. and 21.2, but 21.2 really was a repeat. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so you have two point ones of these very low barrier to entry tests, very low loading things that people over the course of the last year, how long have we been in quarantine? A year. Yeah. yeah. So everybody has been doing like body weight based, mm -hmm. high turnover fast. Like, so general people that are just interested in CrossFit, their overall capacity in that specific stuff is probably through the roof versus yeah. like higher skills that they 
couldn't train are probably way lower or strength metrics, which yeah, if yeah. they didn't have access to barbells yeah. and things like that. And we don't really, factor. we don't really know. Like the whole stage one could be themed that way. Like the next test is people are like, Oh, well the heavy one for bigger people is come like no, <laughs> yeah, heavy one, not, 95 pound thrusters. Yeah, like 95, just, 65 yeah, pound it thrusters. Not, yeah. It could just be like a, you know, a standard workout. Uh, and I think that's really throwing people off because a lot of the people that are used to having good fitness across different styles of tests, are now seeing like, oh, well, this is not going to be different. It's, this might not be a well-rounded open. It might just be like, hey, this is the prerequisite qualifier to get in. You should be top 10% no matter what. Yeah. It's even more reason to say that the objective comparison shouldn't hold the weight that you're yeah. giving them. Like yeah. we can, we can talk about it all day, but it's still like this idea of how do you convince somebody of that so that they yeah. believe it emotionally instead of just like saying, oh yeah, no, yeah. no, it makes sense. <laughs> well, for, and then they for go their, home and they can't sleep when they look at the leaderboard. For yeah. their entire career, the open has been the measurement of their progress for right. the most part, right? Yeah. It's, it's the biggest test of fitness that exists where you're comparing yourself against the entire world. And th it's not that anymore. If you're someone who has aspirations of moving through stage two, it's just not a, a test of your fitness anymore. It's just a thing that you have to do so that you can go test your fitness in, in stage two, stage two, <laughs> yeah. which is a whole different style of tests, Maybe. multiple tests. Well, I mean, it's definitely a different yeah, style yeah. of tests because yeah, the equipment list that they put out. Yeah. yeah. Different equipment and, and timelines. Yeah. Timelines will make a big difference because the repeat nature and also like, uh, for example, we put up Travis and Noah's, uh, point one video. And I happened to be sitting in my office and I had exactly 10 minutes before my next thing to do. And I was like, I'm just going to go on YouTube and like, see what pops up. And a video of Vellner popped up. I saw Vellner score on 21.2. And I was like, that was really impressive. Let me click on this video. And I just kind of like fast forward. And I th saw this one part where he talked about Noah making up 30 seconds on just the set of 50 dumbbell snatches. He didn't reference who it was against. So I was like, oh, he watched Travis and Noah's video that we posted and then used that to create a model and understanding for how he needed to attack the workout, hit the workout after, put up a really good score. That won't happen in stage two. Yeah. And people won't have the benefit of having second thoughts videos, somebody deciding just like, hey, I'm going to do the workout, put my score up and not worry about it. Uh, that whole dynamic of how people are approaching workouts is just different when it's like, Hey, here's eight workouts. Everyone's going to be a little bit more secretive and not share their scores. I was actually having a conversation with one of my athletes about the fact that the leaderboard will be a blind leaderboard in stage two. Who's going to turn in their scores early. It's like, the, it's yeah. the, the, the worst thing that you could possibly do if you're trying to get one of those, you know, those, uh, stage three spots turn in your score early in that. And so you're right. It, it is going to be very different because right now, basically this is the, the most scores I've ever seen turned in on a Friday and a Saturday. Yeah. I mean, there were, I think in the masters 35 to 39, when I was looking, there were like 10,000 scores up or something like that on Saturday morning, which yeah. is a lot compared yeah. to years past. How differently do you think the scores would have looked on these two? If it was a blind leaderboard leading in? Like I think there it, would it have just been goes live on Monday. Fewer repeats, mm -hmm. right? I think there would have been fewer repeats. I you think do? I, I, yes. Yeah, I do. I really? do for sure. And well, I also wonder about like the top scores as well. Like how many people really thought that sub nine was doable on that 21.2? Man. Yeah. That is impressive. Doesn't it just changes your perception and how you frame that workout though. Yeah. And now it's like, oh, well, I saw, I thought top 10, like yeah. or sub 10 was really good. Yeah. Sub nine. What the heck? And yeah. so now it's like, it drives you to go a little bit faster. It's interesting because we've seen a couple of qualifiers now that run a blind leaderboard all the way through the score submission deadline. And it's interesting to think about it from a human sort of like social component, like how much we actually put into the relative comparisons and like for better or worse, like now all of a sudden we have this marker about what's actually possible and it changes what we think is possible and what we can get out of ourselves. Well, I think, you, you know, you said you think there would be fewer repeats with a blind leaderboard. I think it might be the opposite. I thought that like too. my anxiety after having done it the first time knowing like, man, there might be a little bit left on the table and I don't know what's out there. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know where I'm sitting relative to the field. Yeah. That would lead me to be more likely to repeat than looking and going, I'm definitely top 10% with this score. There's no yeah. chance I'm going to repeat. Yeah. I've seen a lot of people and I don't know. I mean, it could be, it could go either way. It could just be like a personality thing, but there's been lots of things where it's almost like, man, I felt good about that. That was, that was what I had for the day. Like, oh man, like this was really like a good score. And it's like, 
Oh, it's dropping. Oh, it's dropping. Oh, it's, <laughs> oh got it. You I it. like how you sunk. <laughs> oh no. I'm it's getting what smaller. I was. Yeah. No, it's just interesting to think about it from like how they actually run the competition. So if they do a blind leaderboard, like a real blind leaderboard for the quarterfinals, what would actually change from a performance standpoint? Or is it going to be the scores as optimal as possible if people can't share what they thought was yeah. like physically impossible or impossible? It could also be cool if they run the stage two as a one day blind leaderboard and then keep like actually run it like a competition. Like they mm. put the workouts out. Here's Friday's workout. Mm. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. have 24 hours to complete it. That's the submission deadline. Your score has to go in. They won't be published until it's X close to what they time. did in stage one of the games, right? Yeah. Like they would do it a day at a time like that and yeah. we'd go live and you wouldn't really know. You had all the workouts ahead of time, yeah. but yeah. you could only do them on that day. That They had judges there that could prevent you from doing them. I mean, I guess some people could have actually tested the workouts the day before, but that- Man, you'd get yeah, really, you'd tired. Be really tired. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm guessing if they did do that, they'd have to, in order to protect it, they'd have to like either- just do the workout or release the workouts one day at a time or the day of release a password that had to be in your video. Like, Hey, this is, you know, Saturday, 2021 two or something like that. One more thought on stage two. So we have an internal leaderboard. How much of an advantage do you think in a blind leaderboard, like stage two scenario, how much of an advantage do you think that actually affords for athletes determining which ones they might need to repeat, how far their scores might be off? You think it's a, a yeah. I, th- I think that we're blessed to have a really good mix of athletes, like elite level athletes who are going to be able to put up top scores on different styles of events to really know like, what is that sort of like physical potential for this style of test? Yeah. Right? So we're, we've been lucky enough so far to come across this range of athletes like that. And I think it's something that it's on us. Like it's our responsibility to take advantage of that and make sure that we're using it to our advantage when we get to that point. Right. Yeah. 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 Cause you'll have a, a top score male or female yeah. somewhere near we're like, okay, this is close. Yeah, like even a- Noah's score was, he was, I think nine thirty three on that first attempt. He was still 45 seconds off of the top score, but it was like 10th place or 12th place. Right. Like that right. one was, was just an anomaly. Huge outliers. Yeah. There were just outlier scores. So it was still good enough that it could give you a concept for where you're aiming for in a specific workout. So yeah. if you're an, if you're a TTT athlete, an individual athlete, just try and be within a couple seconds or a couple minutes of Noah in each yeah. workout and you're probably going to be okay. Yeah, I think you and using Noah as a rabbit might be a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a real interesting process to go through for sure. And also managing, I feel like there's been a, a friendly environment in stage one mm. on site. Sure. Um, sure. I think it'll still be friendly. I think most of the people are confident, but you know, there could be like somebody who's really good that we think is top 120. That's like, oh, here's a specific test that came out that targets one of your big weaknesses yeah. that could potentially keep you out. Now, are you going to be like, well, I don't want them seeing my workout or I want them to go first so I could see where the score is and see the strategy. It's going to change things. It's I think. the other interesting thing about this year is like the number of people who move from stage one to stage two is still large enough with their scoring system to really put a damper on your weakness, right? So yeah. they do that placement-based scoring and there's 10% of people in your division who can finish above you on one of your weaknesses. It's yeah. not like at regionals where now you're comparing yourself <laughs> against 30 or 40 people yeah. and like your score doesn't really change yeah. that much. There's <laughs> thousands of people now who can still interrupt your process. Yeah. So yeah. what you're saying is when they bring wall walks back out in the age group qualifier, <laughs> I'm <laughs> fucked. You no, just do, do it on that blue mat this time. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. That yeah. slippery one yeah. that you did. Yeah. It's That's, interesting. To, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to give him shit about beating oh. him. But, <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you beat me? I yeah, did. he did. Oh, because man. I did it on the blue mat, not the right, slippery I'm one. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> and I know repped you twice, then we would have tied. Yeah, um, I just thought it was interesting. I, I always find it interesting that like the movement came out, and my first thought with the wall walk was like, come on, this is stupid. Mm. Uh, n- not because it's a stupid movement. I think it's a great training implement. But when I'm thinking of a movement done for time, I was like, this is so stupid. At the end of that, I was like, oh, maybe it's not so stupid. Like maybe it actually could be used as a test and they thought it out. Other problems, like not having the standards and scoring and all that stuff, like told to people that had to judge it beforehand, I feel like is kind of unfair from a sporting perspective, but that's not really where I was going there. But I just find it interesting even in the course of four days of the open, how much progress and understanding of how to do a movement faster and more efficiently, how it happens. And then realizing the, the dumbbell snatch four years ago was put out and watching what the evolution of people's skill sets in the dumbbell snatch in four years, Mm. thinking about like, if they put 
a repeat of 21.1 and wall walks come out uh, four, four years, years from, from now, now, what people's technique is going to look like. How, how much are you going to include wall walks in people's training designs? Me? Yeah. I don't know. I think it probably just skill work, like do yeah. wall walks and figure out this speed and rhythm. It made a big difference. And they're like Danielle Brandon. Mm -hmm. So most people ghost road on the way down. They would like go, go up slide. and then yeah. kind of slide down the wall and make sure their mm -hmm. hands touch before their feet. I think Danielle Brandon would come get hands down and then step her feet down to the ground. And when I talked to Alessandra, she said that the biggest limiter was her shins. She that would was fall and hit. And I think the combination of getting like jammed into planner, planner flexion, if your feet were splayed out or dorsiflexion, if you were like tucked underneath you paired with the volume of jumping actually might be more efficient in that workout to like figure out a step down technique to save the jumping muscles, which I had never thought about. So I think there are little things that maybe putting them in Metcons on like easier days and just seeing what happens might be something that I actually well, do do. It's amazing how much crowdsourcing a movement like that. And like, you know, you get done and you see someone like Daniel Brandon and it's yeah. like, okay, well, this is the technique that everyone should train yeah. for right now. Yeah. Right. And so everyone starts doing that. And then someone comes up with like a little bit of a movement evolution. Yeah. That's just a little bit better. And you know, that gets run with, I saw it with, uh, Noah's burpee box jump overs. He, yeah. he did a step technique on the box that I'd, I'd actually never seen anyone do before that cut out an entire step of the movement. Yeah. And I'm like, where, where'd you come up with this? He's like, I don't know. I was just playing. Yeah. I like shared that with some of my athletes. I'm like, you need to, to start practicing this. He is really good at figuring out how to make things efficient for his body. And yeah. I never, I've never, I'm the, maybe the one movement I'll take credit for helping him with specifically is a deadlift. Like we came up and we tried to repattern that mm. one thing specifically, which could have been psychological from back injuries and stuff too. Yeah. But he just naturally is like, he'll get a movement and he'll just like play with it for a little while, find a rhythm of something he likes. And it's just like locked in and it holds up under fatigue. It's a really impressive skill set. It's a different type of skill set than Travis or like other elite yeah. athletes. That skill of being able to self-organize inside of the moment. Is that teachable? I don't know. I don't think so. It's, I think it's just kind of how he's wired. Yeah. Well, I mean, watching him do the wall walks, like he didn't watch the announcement. He came in, like read it and then did it. And like his method of doing it is how we try to communicate to other people. Like yeah. look at what Noah did four yeah. and three yeah. out, keep it sustainable. Like yeah. he found one of the best ways out there and with no he did notice it that morning. Yeah. So he came in, he, yeah. it's not like he was up late yeah. the night before he came in Friday morning and did that. Yeah. He's, I, I am in the process of reading conscious coaching and he fits the mold of the technician so clearly. Mm -hmm. If you go back, I know yeah, you've I read, gotta it read a, it a while. Ago. I remember reading it and thinking I could like categorize my athletes and then continue reading them. Like, Oh, they might also fall into this one and they yeah. might also fall into this <laughs> one. And for myself, I'm like, I'm everything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm basically, I, I did I'm the, an enigma. I did the same thing when I, when I read it, every single one of them that I read, I'm like, man, I have There's qualities. A, find of, a piece of yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Noah is very much a technician. If he's not I wouldn't categorize him as the technician, yeah. but he has a lot of the technician qualities just having watched. Yeah. Him. There was one that was like, I wanted to say like a butterfly or something like somebody who was like light and airy. And <laughs> I, that was, I remember thinking back in the day, like, Oh, that's Noah. Oh, I was thinking Bryn. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe yeah. I haven't gotten there yet. Yeah. So that's sort of like the elite athletes, their experience and our perception of their experience in the open so far. I think the next group of people that we should, talk about, or maybe try and talk to a little bit more is maybe the intermediate athletes, maybe like the RX level athletes. Yeah. Like how is it that you are going through the open or maybe like going through your training and leading up to the open? And how is it affecting your emotional experience of the open? I think that a lot of people obviously are falling in the trap of overvaluing or over identifying the score, right? Like yeah. assuming that their score is a reflection of themselves, their training, where they're, where they're at in their season. And I think one of the big contextual things that I've tried to tell people is to make sure that you understand that if you're at that level, you're not a professional. This is not something that you're getting paid for. This is not something that's putting food on the table. This is a hobby. It's a passionate hobby of yours, but it's a hobby. And what we want out of your CrossFit experience is this idea of making sure that you are a better person for going through CrossFit, yeah. right? Not this idea of like, Hey, do the best you can inside this moment and then throw it all away and like move on to the next phase of your life. Yeah. We're not going to be doing CrossFit for the rest of our lives. Like yeah. we might be working out, but we're not going to be a CrossFitter for the rest of our lives. And so I, you try and paint that context for somebody in that realm and say like, Hey, what is it about CrossFit that's going to make you a better version of yourself in the future? And one of them is this idea of character and integrity, right? This yeah. idea of like, 
hey, put your hard work in, have discipline around, you know, your training routines, your fueling routines, your recovery your recovery routines, yeah. what, what those aspects of the discipline and the self-motivation can carry over into that next phase of your life. Yeah. When we think about the open like that, those things can get compromised with overvaluing or over-identifying with the score. So now yeah. like you look at the leaderboard and you are deflated because you thought that you were going to be whatever it is in North America, like top 7,000 or something. And now you're sitting at like 9,000, 10,000. You're like, well, this season's over. I might as well just stop. <laughs> right. Like there's no reason to do in week three. I can't make up that ground anymore. Yeah. It's like, no, 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 that wasn't the purpose. That's not the purpose. Yeah. Right. Like that's a goal for this year. That's okay. That goal might've, you know, flown away. The purpose of your journey inside of CrossFit is not to finish top 10% in this any, any given season. You're not going to be telling your kids about that. You're not going to be a better human in the future yeah, yeah. for having done that. You're going to be a better version of yourself if you finish what you started. If you learn to hold yourself accountable to the kinds of things that you commit yourself to. And that's yeah. one of the big things that I've been trying to tell people all along. And that's like that Instagram post that I made is this idea of like, hey, listen, like, things aren't always guaranteed to fall in your favor, right? Like, and it doesn't matter how much hard work you put in. It doesn't matter how much you care about it. I guarantee everybody else cares just as much as you do. Yeah. And it doesn't like entitle you to anything. I also think too, just at, like one of the biggest areas for growth as a human is getting punched in the face is oh, getting humbled. Like <laughs> it, the, it's funny. You see like fighters, actual fighter, like Conor McGregor, you see this huge, huge ego, the projection, whatever. But in reality, you cannot get to a high level in any combat sport without getting the shit kicked out of you for years. Actually, physically, actually, like not you're just literally, mentally. yeah, you're yeah. literally getting beat up for years at a time. Yeah. So the sport itself humbles you yeah. to the point that you then are really good at. I find there's some parallels in CrossFit. It's just like racing is different. You can come in with just like a better gas tank, but. Sure. Um, I think for anybody in that intermediate level, putting yourself into those uncomfortable positions where you thought you were capable of 5,000th and you end up in 10,000th, it's a good humility check. And the humility <laughs> check, in, in spite of being painful, does help you grow. And there's, I, there's oh, this God. quote that I had from Billie Jean King, which is basically exactly what you said. It was on Morning Chalk Up, and I, not, yeah, I don't always yeah. like their stuff, but this is one of the quotes that they put up. It says, Sport teaches you character. It teaches you to play by the rules. It teaches you to know what it feels like to win and lose. And it teaches you about life. And like, that's exactly what you're yeah. saying is like, ex like go into this journey and learn how to be humble. Like yeah. you're not entitled to these results. You're not entitled to the top 10%, but yeah. you are entitled to learning the lessons along the way that are going to make you a better version of yourself in the future. Yeah. Right? I've actually found, so I, I do think I would have, I'm, I'm not going to like verbalize all of them here, but I, I would have contentions with how they run the sport for elite athletes. I think that there could be, I think they could do better job with figuring out how to source the best in the world, create a long season, maybe have them do the open for fun, whatever. I think there's, I think there's better ways for that. However, for the intermediate athlete, I feel like this open actually has been really spot on. I think that the repeat of a test four years ago gave a lot of people who were first introduced to this workout, who've been training a little bit consistently, an opportunity to hit massive PRs. I yep. mean, I think even on site, like I remember talking to Ansley, I think she improved by four minutes. Wow. Aaron, Aaron uh, got time capped and finished. So like just going through the, the process of training consistently showed like some very clear objective improvements in skills and in ability to handle a workout, different mentality. So I think that's been really good. And I think the barrier to entry being low has been good. I think just overall, it seems like the experience of intermediate athletes and going after, like actually trying to go after repeats. I don't think those two specifically did, but just having the opportunity to start working on what used to be an important skill for elites with top 10%, it's not, but I do think there was a lot learned in figuring out how to like sell out and finish a workout and be completely dead and then convince yourself two or three days later after watching a video that you could be better and then actually proving it to yourself yeah. that you could be better. Yeah. That's a interesting skill that uh, I think this specific open has been really good for intermediates for. To that same point, I've actually talked to a couple of affiliate owners and who are also competitors and they all say that they like this format uh, much more than the old five week format. Cause number one, their members, their, their intermediate and novice athletes can stay more engaged. Three weeks yeah. is a much shorter time span for the <laughs> human, uh, you know, yeah. human attention <laughs> than five weeks. Yeah. And it's, you know, it, it disrupts their business a little bit less for five weeks. And if they are competitive 
or have competitors in their gym, they can put more focus on the novice, the intermediates, the people that are doing the open for the experience of the open, and then coach their competitors in yeah. stage two and put the, you know, and get the gym kind of rallied behind them. So from that perspective, I think it, yeah. it's also been a good thing for just the affiliate community in general. From my perspective, it's been awesome. So <laughs> two weeks and one day after the first announcement of 21.1, I think everybody I coach will be done with the open just two weeks and one day. Cause like you have Thursday yep. and then two yeah. weeks later on Friday, the opens pretty much o- my responsibilities are pretty much over, which is like, wow, Max is retiring awesome. for the yeah. season. <laughs> like keep, let's keep this going. <laughs> it's, it's hard to communicate how the like seasons past, like how intense the open was for us coaches. Yeah. And it, I mean, it's, you know, it's small potatoes. We have a lot of flexibility yeah, with our yeah. schedule and like, it feels like you're complaining about nothing, yeah. but man, it's hard. Like yeah. those five weeks are freaking rough. Yeah. A lot of time invested into watching the same movements <laughs> over and over. Yeah. I'm really glad I didn't have to do any, I'm like, look, I'll do all my video review in stage two. If you can't finish in the top 10% right now, we're done. <laughs> I still love you. I still yeah. love you, but yeah. Yeah. video, you're a good yeah, person I'll and only check your video for standards pretty much. There you go. Yeah. What else? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. What I are think- the, what are the scores on the leaderboard you've been most impressed with? I think the sub nine minute scores on this most recent one. Yeah. So there was two, right? Holty yeah. and, yeah. uh, and Dakota Rager. Dakota Rager. That does not surprise me. That he did it? Well, that he there was a, the one. Yeah. Wasn't yeah. there a teen there was athlete? An, I, yeah. Mal Emma? O'Brien? No, Mallory. Somebody. I, yeah, Mallory. I think she's actually from one of the gyms from an athlete that I coach. And that, now that I'm thinking about it, I think she's a teen athlete. Emma, Emma Carey. Emma. Yeah. Emma Carey. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. She's, uh, she's uh, I think, 16 now and did a sub nine minute. Yeah. Golly. 21.2. That is so insane. Im- so, so I, impressive. I watched the video and there's efficiency that could be had on yeah. some of the, the burpee box jump overs. Like there's, there's potentially room in the tank for her to go even faster yeah. in, in future years, regardless of just developing more capacity and more output. That's insane. Yeah. That, that, I mean, the volume of scores, even sub 10 on that workout, cause you're basically doing fast burpee box jumps and <laughs> cycling the dumbbell at a faster than normal cadence, like not just yeah, go you're smooth. Ripping and it around. You're actually like pulling it down to the ground and yeah. pulling it back up, which I find super impressive. Uh, I think Brent Fikowski's point one score was the thing that stuck out the most. I know he's good on his hands, but he's a big man. And he, I think he was a 12 something for the ball walk workout or 11. It something. was fast. Yeah. yeah it was, it was really, and really it was impressive clean too. Yeah. I really liked good how well quality that reps. Yeah. Long ass arms. He was going back in like two steps. Yeah. He's just so deliberate with his movement, but yeah. he still is able to move fast. There's another technician. Yeah. yeah. The guy yeah. yeah. I would say that. Technician. Yeah. Yeah. He, he might fall in that category for me a little bit more he, than he's Noah. a professor archetype. <laughs> <laughs> Get it right. I, I mean, I, there impressive, uh, you know, scores at the top, but I mean, I've been equally impressed with people who are able to accept their first scores and like sort of deal with the hit to their ego about not really being where they want to be. Yeah. Right. Like there's been plenty of my athletes who like, yeah, there's been a lot of people who are upset with their scores and it's not where they thought it was going to be. And they wanted to redo it. And like, you have to try and like talk them off that ledge or give in and say like, Hey, maybe this is what's best for you to go out and like banish your demons a little bit. But for those of us, for those of them, I'm not in this boat (laughs) who are willing to just do a one and done, stick to the plan, move on to the next stage where it's really where it matters, where their season is. That to me is a really impressive, mature mindset that I've been very happy to see. Well, we had talked about this a little bit before we got on camera and, and that's just the fact that for some athletes when, you know, in years past where the open has been their, the thing, it's like the thing that qualified them for sanctionals or the thing that qualified them for regionals, they had this peak, right? So they started to taper back a couple of weeks going into yeah. the open and they were fresh. And between the open workouts, they did very little other than like mm-hmm. touch on what might be coming up in the, in the yeah. coming weeks and then recovery work and their open scores, you know, relative to the world have been really good. And now where they're going through the open kind of training through the open and, and, you know, kind of getting beat down and they're still pretty tired because they have this like 10 day taper window built into the season before stage two, their scores are nowhere near relatively where they have been in the past. And yeah. that is really tough for them to deal with. They're no, like, Oh man, I'm, I'm so not well prepared. Yeah. It's well, like, it's, it's crazy. I mean, I, I was listening to, I think it was Andrew Huberman podcast today and he talked about this concept called a, Oh man, it's like a reward prediction error. 
it's basically how, like how reinforcement learning works, right? Like you, you have a dopamine release or trigger with an expectation, and then you have a dopamine release with you get the reward or you have the experience, right? And so those kinds of athletes are really, really used to, they expect to finish well, they see themselves finish well, there's dopamine that there's a match there, right? There's no so prediction error, doing it. right? And then, but what ends up happening is they have this expectation, they have this dopamine level that's here, and then there's a mismatch with the experience. And what ends up actually happening at a physiological level is dopamine's blunted. Like you, it will downregulate, and you're not getting the feeling that you want. You feel like shit when your expectation is mismatched. <laughs> That's my whole life. I, it's, <laughs> but it's crazy to think about it like this. It's basically like, you know, if I'm, if I ring a bell and I give you a treat, like sort of like Jim yeah. Halpert from yeah, the office, yeah. like, you know, Dwight <laughs> wants a mint in his mouth and then like you ring the bell and there's no treat. It's like, oh yeah. And that's what's happening. And it's crazy huh. to think about it because there is like a neurochemical response to not having your expectation met. And some people are dealing with that by saying, fuck it. I'm going to do it again to get my, yeah, I want my know. dopamine. Yeah. Right? And then I they want go and, and they get their better score yeah. and then they get their yeah. dopamine. But do you think as coaches that we could have had conversations with those athletes beforehand and been like, all right, you should expect going into this to not perform as well as yeah. you have in years past, because we're going to train through it. Do you think that would have even had any no. bearing? And I feel like it's almost like the wrong headspace to be yeah. in. Like, mm -hmm. it's like, Hey, don't care if you do badly. It's hard to say that to a competitor. I it's think. impossible to yeah. say that. It's yeah. impossible to say that. And that's the difference with like, like you can convince somebody of something objectively, but until they emotionally believe it, yeah. it's never going to sink yeah. in. Never going to sink so in. So for elite athletes, I feel like, you know, Noah having to redo it kind of sucked because he's like one of the, you know, people that would be the, you know, the role models. Yeah but he had to redo it because his reps were legitimately not good. Like yeah. his hand was coming off the line early because he was going to do it because Travis's first score wasn't good. And because they were going to be training partners, Travis is like, oh, I'll just jump in with him and do it. Not necessarily because he needed to, but because he wanted to be yeah, a part of pressured that. into it. So then it was like, all right, well the two like most visible people that I have, even though I just said, don't repeat workouts unless you absolutely have to are repeating the workout. So it kind of set a bad initial standard they got good, relatively good quality training in. And then now I think are kind of on this path of training, but I don't think a lot of people that fell into that repeat boat were like that. I don't think they were training. So any, like now we're about two weeks out from stage two, right? Two weeks and two days yeah. at the time of filming this tips for like our, even RX people who, who might know mathematically, they're not finishing in the top 120 as we go into the last workout. And then you have about a week of training and then half a week of like a little taper week before the workouts come out and maybe we get more info on it. What would you recommend or how are you dealing with your athletes? Maybe I mean, it's a better question between now and then like short term. Yeah. Yeah. Like how do you, it, Eve, let's say they fucked everything up. Like it went <laughs> completely like, how would you try it's to very write? Common, yeah, very common yeah, experience. Yeah. How do we write this ship? in the last two weeks to optimize. Cause we all know like, yeah. that's where the real leaderboard is. That open leaderboard is basically like okay. fucking yeah. well, no, slashed Number away. one, they should have last weekend done a stage two simulation. Yeah. <laughs> so like yeah. this past weekend, <laughs> if they, they weren't doing, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what should in an ideal world. That's what should have happened. And then this week probably like taper back a little bit into this open workout. I figure the open workout will be a really good dose of intensity, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I hope yeah. I hope the open <laughs> workout will be yeah. a really good dose of intensity. Max passive, max duration passive hang. Then oh gosh, <laughs> into a max duration sandbag hold. Yeah, super intense. <laughs> yeah. No, I yeah. think a short term for that athlete who doesn't really have a realistic chance of advancing into what's it called? Semis. Semifinals. Semifinals. Yes. Semifinals. Yeah. yeah. Stage three. Um, right now is about building confidence. You want them to feel as prepped and primed and ready mentally as you possibly can get, which means touching base with them. Hey, what movements from the equipment list from the quarterfinals do you feel that you want more touches on? What feels rusty right now? What is it that you feel is going to get you best prepped for that stage? Yeah. And then you also try and frame the experience of quarterfinals to say like, Hey, this is a learning experience. This is not a grading experience for you, right? Like we're not really going to go in there and like put a bunch of value into like where you're at on any specific test. It's about learning what it's like to compete in that kind of environment so that when you're exposed to it again, you're going to be better for having had this experience. It's like taking your pre-test on fractions before you've covered fractions in third oh, grade. Man. Owen's learning <laughs> yeah. fractions right now. It's a hard concept. But no, I think like short term, it's basically just trying to do the best you can to set them up for success. And I feel like a lot more of that is going to be mental than physical. Yeah. I mean, two weeks is not really much time to train anything to the point of like getting it better. You can get more touches on it. You can get more exposure to it to improve the feel of it. But I feel like a lot of it's just upstairs. One of, one of the biggest mistakes I've made in 
years past, not, not more recent years, but when tapering CrossFitters for something that's really dense, like a dense testing period, like a stage two, where we, where we anticipate, you know, like five, maybe six tests across five days or four days, um, is letting their volume tolerance deteriorate so that what happens is, you know, you, you taper them like you would an endurance athlete. That's what I used to do. Yeah. You know, I came from an endurance sport background, so I tapered them like that. So two, three days out, they were doing very little. And then they're so sore after the first day they can barely move. Well, yeah. that would be from a, a training perspective, you know, you talked about what you would do from a conversation mm -hmm. and, you know, psychological perspective taper, but don't lose your volume tolerance yeah. to things like 150 wall balls mm -hmm. or 200 wall ball, which yeah. is likely to show up in stage two. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we will do that in the design elite via EMOMs and creative ways of not doing smash your face in Metcons the week before, <laughs> but we'll, we'll try to do that. Yeah, no, I feel like the biggest message that we can try and communicate as we head into the last week of the open is just, you know, stay the course. Like, and the course yeah. is also probably, you know, dependent on the individual. You know, if you're an elite, know that yeah. this is week three, you know where your race is at. It's probably not right here. Do the things that are going to set you up well for the next stage. If you are an intermediate RX and you're still fighting for that 10%, still make sure that, you know, finish strong, finish what you started, but don't overvalue or over-identify with the results. Know yeah. that you're not doing this to compete inside the sport. You're doing this to make yourself a better version in the future and take the lessons appropriately. Yeah. I think to that point as well, if you're someone who's sitting in like 8,000, if you're a male in the North American region, you're sitting 8,000th place. Remember that a lot can change in one week with just some different movements and equipment yeah. And, yeah. and things like that. So yeah. people who had out. a big, like a big drop from week one to week two, like they might think that they're out of it, but listen, you could probably jump just as much from week three, from week two to week I, three, right? I think I moved up 750 spots this week. Mm. So I have a question. In 2019 Open, I got sick right before 0. 0.5 on Thursday, I, I think. I remember that. And I waited until Monday to do it, and I was still sick. I'm a bad sick person, and I'm a <laughs> slow recoverer when I'm sick. And I came in, and I did the workout. I was, like, battling in my head. Like, I'm not a professional athlete. I got other people to focus on, but I did the workout, and it was hor it was one of the worst 10 minutes of my life. Mm -hmm. Like I, or it wasn't 10 minutes. I, <laughs> I Tw take, 28 yeah, minutes. it was long. <laughs> it was whatever the time cap was. Uh, it was horrible. Like it was a super, super challenge. If you had somebody in that same boat, like not a professional athlete, not going to make it anywhere in the sport coming up on point three right now, not feeling good. Something's niggling. When you say be like a completionist, finish strong, get what you want out of this. I made the decision that I like, I had to do it. Like I, yeah. I was going to test myself and figure out, like I signed up, I'm putting all my scores in, I'm committed to doing this in hindsight. I don't know if it was the best decision. I don't know if I should have just let everyone on site, make fun of me for not finishing and just <laughs> stay home and rested. What would like, how do you coach those types of well, things? Well, I was going to throw it back at you and ask you, did you get value out of that? Was there value? Like, cause I know that I, yeah. we've talked a lot about like your internal dialogue yeah. and how you talk to yourself <laughs> yeah. and it's not necessarily <laughs> how I would, you know, coach somebody to talk to themselves, <laughs> but for your individual experience, like, do yeah. you think that there is value in finishing? Like if you hadn't finished, I can only imagine what you would have been saying to yourself afterwards. Yeah. I, so y for my mental health, yes, it was yeah. valuable. And yeah. I think from my perspective, it was valuable. I, th I think that a lot of the decisions I make that I retroactively think that was stupid make me tougher as a human, make me more resilient as a human and make me handle things better. And I like that outcome. Yeah. I don't know if I'm being honest with myself and being vulnerable here. I don't know if those are optimal decisions for performance or longevity. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I think there is def definitely something to be rewarded, but it's like for everything given something is taken. And I don't know. Sure. I don't know. I'm pretty sure I coach differently for others than I do myself. Like when I make those decisions, I don't, I don't think I would have said, Hey, you know, you are, you can't breathe through your nose, your throat, <laughs> especially now in a pandemic. <laughs> yeah, it'd be a lot different now, I think. But, uh, I, I do wonder that cause I, you know, there is an aspect of this sport that does cultivate a sense of toughness for people that yeah. in a world that's very padded and untough. Like yeah. when you, when I meet people sometimes now, I'm like, wow, you are just like weak. <laughs> so soft. Yeah. 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 But that's yeah. one of the things, like when we talk about the positive aspects of a CrossFit experience that you can carry over into the later stages yeah. of your life, that's one of them, yeah. right? It's just learning like what you're actually made of. Yeah. Like a lot of us go through our lives and like, 
not going to get into fights. Like you go and roll around a lot, but like, I'm not going to get punched. I'm very, I'm not very likely to get punched in the face. Like, have, have you ever been punched in the face? I have, but it's yeah, been okay. a long time. Yeah, yeah, me, were you drunk? Too. No, I wasn't drunk. Oh, okay. He was drunk. Okay. Yeah. I was drunk. You were drunk. <laughs> I punched you. Definitely. <laughs> it's actually, you guys fought. Oh, okay. oh man. I don't think we would have been friends back in like the teenage no, years. No, we talked yeah. about this. Yeah. I don't think so. Yeah. yeah. Didn't they call you Ruthenstein? Yeah. When you were drunk. <laughs> we, yeah. Should, we should not. Sure no one would have been friends with you. <laughs> we should not go into this on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. yeah Shifting like back. That. Yeah. No, I think that um, using the sport and using the experience to, you know, test yourself is a great way to like bring some value out of it into yeah. your future, you know, experience, whatever's, whatever's coming up for you. If I had somebody in that situation, I'd want to really lay out as clearly as possible what I think the risks are, what I think the potential benefits are, and then try and have as objective a conversation as possible. Mm. Because I feel like what happened with you is that internal dialogue was focusing on a lot of the bad <laughs> stuff, right? Like yeah. people are going to make fun of me if I don't finish, yeah, yeah. I'm going to feel soft afterwards. Um, maybe not enough weight was put into this other side of like, all right, like what's the risk if I go down this yeah, route yeah. or what's the potential benefit if I don't go down this route? Like would yeah. I still be able to train better in the next week? I think trying to lay all that out and then having them come to a decision that's maybe a little bit more, I, I don't know, maybe a little bit more clarity was how I would go about yeah, it. Yeah. But I don't think there's an answer. I yeah. Don't think yeah. It's like, hey, I just, it was right just a story. Yeah. yeah. I, and I remember watching you God, and just so being like, it's a tough motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> Why is he doing this? So maybe there was another aspect that in that you inspired some other people around you, which I always think is an important uh, meaning or an important purpose in, in competing. Like yeah. you obviously inspired him. He's like, damn, he's, that was he's inspiration. So <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm trained through being sick multiple yeah, times. I don't know about it, inspiration, but I, <laughs> I, more like, I don't want to be like that. <laughs> <laughs> it was almost like I, I respected what you were doing because I knew why you were doing it and yeah, I knew yeah. how painful it was to do it. And yeah. so like, I knew like the choice that you made and like you accepted the pain that is, was associated with it. And so like you grew in respect that day. Yeah. It wasn't necessarily like, oh, look at how much <laughs> Not, you can hurt. Didn't, it's didn't like, grow an intelligence. You knew it was going to hurt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You knew what, what was going into it yeah, and you yeah. did it anyways. So like I can, I can respect that. Yeah. All right. So out of the personal narrative, any quick tips as we sign off for people as they're finishing other than just like finish strong, remember why you did it, that type of stuff. Make sure you submit your score before the deadline. Yeah. I had mm -hmm. a paranoid feeling about that last night. I went through and checked some of my athletes. I'm like, did they post their scores? <laughs> the problem is the time window that we're in, like there's, they, they don't have to be validated yet. Yeah, so there's yeah, people yeah. who have blanks yes. and I'm texting them. Did you submit? Did you submit? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Back off coach. <laughs> Good way. So that's it. That's it. I think. Agreed. All right. Any tips for coaches? Hang in there. Yeah. We're almost there. Quarterfinals are going to be awful. Try and get some sleep between now and then. All right. <laughs> My last Sleep? tip would be enjoy the octopus. Mm, get your shirts. <laughs>